Griselda Mossett, and I live in Faversham, been here for 37 years, and really loving the um, creative vibes in the whole place. I mean, it is a very encouraging place to live. I have always been a writer. I mean, writing, you can do it any place, any, any time, anywhere. It's a, an ongoing journey. It's something that you never stop learning about how to improve your writing. Me as a writer, I've always, I've always written things. I've read like a crazy woman. Reading and writing are so close, aren't they? You have to, you have to read to learn how to write. And so, reading as a child, all the great classics, children's stories. I read the children's encyclopedia from beginning to end. By the time I was 11, I had read all of Arthur Mee's children's encyclopedia, the whole thing, carried it home, read it. So obsessive reader and, and very inspired to be a writer as a child. But I never really did anything with it until I got to the BBC, where I decided to move from studio management and into journalism. And that's where the, the real lesson started, how to write a story as succinctly and sparely and accurately as possible. Great start. I'm Denise Turner and I live in a village near Faversham and I am not a natural writer, unlike Griselda. I am a natural reader. I was lucky enough from a very young age to have parents who bought me books and took me to the library when such things still existed. And I had a library ticket, so I went every Saturday and got a new book. And I went to a marvellous school where they, um, in the reception class, we had a little house, a little Wendy house that had miniature books inside and you were allowed to choose one and go in and read to yourself. And I think that's what started my love of stories and reading. My first degree was in design. I went to Brighton Polytechnic and graduated in the 80s and worked as a designer. Um, in textiles and fashion um, and I'd always hedge my bets because I also did business administration and moved over to public relations where I also got an education in how to write for the media in terms of you've got to tell the story in the first 15 words of the sentence and then um, write for 12, write as if a 12 year old could understand it. Um, so that gave me a good grounding. Um, I, wor I worked for many, many years and lived in London, um, were, ended up being in an internet company, um, quite a senior position, and um, had always kind of written commercially but not creatively, still read a lot. And um, I got to um, the age that um, I kind of was looking for something new and decided to go back to uni and I did an MA at the University of Kent in creative writing about 12 years ago and since then I've been on a journey um, to kind of write a novel is what I thought at the beginning but then realised after the universal rejection of my first two novels that I needed to put more time and work into learning the craft of writing something that people actually want to read. So I was lucky enough to hear about um, the group that we're members of, the Faberge Inklings, and I joined about five years ago, I reckon. Maybe just before that, I also fell in love with storytelling, where the oral tradition of storytelling, and studied with... Um, a really amazing guy called Martin Shaw who runs a hedge school down in Devon and studied with him for a couple of years and I think that what that brings to my writing is kind of the craft of storytelling in um, and it's always said by any creative writing um, class that you attend that you should read your work aloud and then you find the, the faults because you stumble on things and I think as we have discovered, we uh, one of the great joys of being in a group is you have to read your work and that's where it all starts to fall down and then you build it back up again. So that's me, really. Uh, Miles Allen used to come over from Maidstone to run this group and we started in the garden in my house and it was on a Wednesday evening. It's when they do bell practice in the parish church. So we, used to, we used to be sitting in the garden and there was this colossal noise coming from the church, which is only two or three hundred yards away. So it was a bit competitive, really. 
and um, so that was quite amusing. But we would be sitting around the table in the garden, and he led us through a series of exercises. He would ask us to fulfill, we'd have to write the story in a hundred words, for example, um, and then read that out. And that was a, a strong discipline how you had to get a beginning, a middle, and an end, and some kind of plausible thing in the middle. The interesting thing is, this is, I would think for any writing group, it's quite important to work out fairly early on what your objective is as a group, because some people really just want to learn to write um, romantic poetry to, to sell to greetings cards manufacturers, or they just want to write um, a story to give to their grandchildren, or, you know, they, they have relatively achievable ambitions. Whereas what we found gradually, the ones who stayed in the group and who carried on with it the longest were the ones who actually seemed to have a serious ambition to produce serious books. I think you, you would agree with that, wouldn't you? Definitely. That, that we've, we've coalesced as a group with quite high ambitions to write something in, not important, because not, I'm not trying to be judgmental about it, but something with real... Um, Real integrity heft. and con heft. It's sort of something weighty. And, um, I mean, personally, I've got about ten different writing projects. And my problem is trying to do enough work on any of them and also to to marshal my energies because I'm not very well at the moment. So trying to put enough energy to, into any of them to push them further forward. But the great thing about having a group is that they can keep track of what you where you were up to with whatever project it is and they're saying hang on a minute I don't understand I don't remember why are you saying it like this who who's that who are you talking about and the criticism and the critiquing can get quite tough and I think that has become a real cornerstone of the inklings that we um that we're willing to to take and to give quite hard criticism um because actually that and that has turned out to be hugely important because if your friends who you know understand what you're trying to do um if they're saying i don't understand this they're probably right you say no but i meant i sh I, I already told you this and they're saying no 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 it doesn't work and then if you're if they're saying that then you have to listen and that's been um massively massively helpful yeah i'd certainly concur with that i found it quite tough going at first because of this criticism and um you know there are temptations for one to throw one's toys out the pram and go <laughs> off in a in a hissy fit but if you really are serious about your craft you have to pick yourself up and stand up and do it again it's about getting really useful critical feedback that's in a, that's supportive as well i mean it's not like we're not like a couple of nasty people that sit around the table and and criticize for the sake of it it's said with love and it's said with good intent so and miles is still part of that so he kind of keeps a fatherly eye on us from a distance and it's quite nice knowing that he's still around and in fact he's proved to be a mine of information he he has a business of his own not just as a writer and a writing tutor but as a, a publisher and to help people to self-publish it has been another really powerful thing, having his expertise, isn't it? Having his kind of know-how. Mm -hmm. And we weren't just finding our way in the dark. So currently there's four active members in the group. Um, and they are myself, Denise Turner, Griselda Can Musset, um, Francis Rowley Bowman, Beaumont and John Waring. At the moment, we've been a little bit sidetracked because we've been working on short stories to re oh. get ready for publication. I came up with an idea of publishing this book last year because we are really lucky in Faversham to have a literary festival. We all want to be published and I thought, well, one way of doing that is we could publish ourselves to sell at this ideal place um, to people that actually are interested in our work. So that was the thinking behind this. And we all came together as a group last year with the intent of getting this book ready for February. So it's roughly worked out that we've got about four or five stories or poems or extracts in the book each. 
Um, I mean, one of the things is that we all four of us have such different writing styles. We've written such different kinds of stories. If we did a sequel, I mean, if we ever did, our readers would know a bit more about what to expect, that I write a certain kind of story, Denise writes a kind of... A, I mean, she's got the most wonderful dystopian story, the best size story, just, I mean, wonderful, scary stuff. And you think, God, perhaps that's how the world is going, you know. And it, and it is, it's very, very interesting getting these glimpses into the future, which I think short stories are always good for that. They mm. give you a little chink of light back into the past or the present, but they can tell you something about what's coming. And it's, it's a sizzling, a sizzling experience, really. Um, I'll just explain, if you like. Um, we, we did try, originally, intermingling all our stories. I've got four to start with, and these are loosely, uh, rough, three of them at any rate, are based in a place that might or might not be Faversham. I mean, it never quite says where it is. One of them is Scottish, um, but they are sort of set in the here and now, and they are uh, anecdotes. Mm, we'll see. They've all got a good... Um, smattering of humour, haven't they? They're, they're all, all, they're all, they're all meant to be slightly funny and, and quite dark in some ways. Um, then Fra Frances Beaumont's stories. Now, she has drawn on her experience when she worked in Africa, lived and worked in Africa. So she's got... And she also has worked as an occupational therapist. So she's hers are very much to do with caring about people and um, and and foreign experiences of Britain and... Um, she's got an excerpt also from her amazing work, which we all hope is going to get to Hollywood, about her, the great love of her life, which was with a man called Jolliver, who was a, 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 a tug skipper on the Medway, but he was born with no hands and only one foot. And how a man like that could actually operate a great motorboat, it's um, beyond me. But anyway, she's got an extract from that book in hers here. And then Denise has got her five stories, um, which are really, I mean, I find them absolutely scintillating, very, Thank you. very um, dazzling stories. They, they've all got a twist in them that you don't quite expect, really. And John has got three, three stories which are longer. One of them is the first one he really wrote for, with us in the group, which is definitely based in somewhere that could be Faversham. And uh, he, finished, he comes originally from the Forest of Dean, so his last story, which is called In New Mind, is written in dialect. And that is another very troubling story, isn't it, really? Yeah, but it's also really funny as it's well. It's extremely I think he, funny. His stories are very humorous. But his novel, his, he's got an extract from, called Ritual from his longer piece. He's actually written a series of um, 12. fantasy books aimed at teenage, teenage young adults. And um, they are kind of um, based in the distant, well, in the future. And the past. And the past. And they're amazing. I can't actually describe what they are. But they're, they're dystopian, fantasy, historical, um, amazing, amazing stories. And so he's got an extract in, in this book as well. So you get quite a, you get a wide choice, really. Um, so I, as you, it is a, it's a, it's a bit like a salad, this book. Yes. There, the things uh, are very no, distinct. No, I'd say it's more like a buffet. Oh, it's a buffet. Yes, it is. There's very distinct elements there, and if we ever did a sequel, which I, we might, you know, we could do. We've all got enough stories to, to put in. Mm -hmm. It is all about storytelling. I know that's something that you've always emphasised ever since I've ever met you. You've talked about you must tell a story, and it is jam packed with stories. It's got lots of stories. One of the reasons that I wanted to do this was I actually wanted to have something in print whether or not it's self-published I think is irrelevant in today's market when you look at people that are making a very good living through self-published literature um, and you only have to look at other channels like Netflix and all of those and some of those amazing episode uh, TV series that we're watching have been started out as self-published novels and it's a real shame that John couldn't be here today to do this yeah. recording because he is the one who has poured hours and hours of time into the design of this. Yeah. There must be lots of people interested in publishing their own books and we do have a bit of basic advice for them. And one is 
Go and first of all look at books that are for sale in supermarkets. There's always a, a little book department. Go and look at them carefully. Mostly they have very bright covers. This one too, we chose not to. We deliberately chose to use right recycled card for the cover because it sends up. In fact, all this paper is recycled paper. It's a bit of a vintage look, really. Um, but things like in a book, if you look at a, a really nicely produced book, it will have enough space around the, around the printed area, the, the gutter in the middle and the margins should be spacious. They all have what's called front matter, which is a title page, and then it has the copyright and printing information on the back of the title page, and it may have a preface or a, a contents page. We're all quite creative. We all have done um, painting and graphics, or John's a potter as well, um, and we he just he came up with this lino print for our logo, this um, inkling pot which that is the second iteration. Um, and he also came up with the little illustration inside for the Inklings, which is based on, if anyone knows Faversham, this is the Guild Hall turned into the Inklings. Um, so they're very pertinent and personal to the group. And I think that comes over for me in the whole feeling and of the book, wouldn't you say? Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, and you can do this using Microsoft Word. I mean, I think John had some problem with the pagination because that's not simple on Word. But there are two other websites people might like to know about. One is um, Bookwright, which is a, um, I think it's owned by a printing company, but they help you to design a book and it's very easy to use. And they have another sub website called blurb.com. So it's blurb.com and bookwright.com. And they're both really handy for helping you practice what your book is going to look like. Do not feel tempted to cut corners and cram as much in as you can by making the print come to the edges of the pages and so on, because people won't want to buy it. We all um, approached various printers, some of whom were known or recommended and some we just found on Google. And um, we got some very scary figures, but we ended up going with a print printing company called imprintdigital.com and they were one that Miles recommended to us in the um, beginning and they were enormously helpful and they specialise in short run books so um, what's not to like really they held our hand and they delivered really quickly so we had a um, basic marketing plan which started off with having the book ready for the Faversham Literary Festival so we thought we'd have books to sell at our reading that was the starting point but um, we also wanted to make it available to a wider audience because only a certain amount of people can fit into the Guild Hall Equal equally we had to think we are novice writers no one's heard of us we're not going to enter on the Sunday Times bestsellers list. So let's start with a stab in the dark and we'll work out, working out backwards, we thought we would each be prepared to sink roughly £200 in each into the project. And if all else failed, we would be prepared to wave goodbye to that money. So that was our starting point. Most of that was going to go on to print, um, but we had to do the work ourselves so we do know the people who run the books shops in Faversham so that was a starting point we've got books in um, all of the places that sell books in Faversham the thing that's probably most important for people is to build your social network so you must have a face page Facebook page um, and start telling everyone on your Facebook page about the book hassle them to buy one that's the only way you're going to make the sales, and that's what we've done. The other thing I would say that was really turned out to be not only a very effective thing to do, but really fun to do, we approached various known writers mm. who had a pre appeared at previous festivals and said, would they endorse the book? So two people came up trumps. One was Amanda Dackham, who runs the festival, who loved it. She really likes it. I mean, she's... She said very nice things about us at the readings in previous years. 
And then the other one who came up trumps was my old mate, Jenny Murray, who I used to work with at the BBC. She said, what a brilliant idea for a community. Prove that everyone has a story to tell, support each other and publish a jolly good read. So we've been able to say, that's a quote from Dame Jenny Murray, journalist and broadcaster. And she, that's what she told us. So we've got a, a national treasure endorsing our book. It helps with the marketing big time. I suppose we could write, we could write a publish little book. We could write a little book on how to publish a book now. Yeah, we're not we? doing that. We'll never get the novels finished. <laughs> no, no, that's so many diversions. The thing that everyone has got is a circle of family and friends. And just, you know, if you want to do some, something along these lines... Enlist people's help because there'll always be someone that can help you. Make it easy for them. Make it make it easy. Have a website, have a Facebook page, talk about it. Actually have fun. The great thing about creativity is that it's it's it is fun. I would gladly do this again. I I would I feel as if I'd know a whole lot more. I I hope that we will learn more as we go on about self-publishing because it's clearly an industry in its infancy. It's going to get better and better. Mm. Self-publishing has had a very um, snobby... Some people view it in a very kind of detrimental way, but I think that the market's really moved on. Um, But one thing about self-publishing is people just have a tendency to chuck it out there before it's properly finished and it's always really important to have your stuff properly properly read by somebody else proofread and um, have some critical feedback on it before you shove it out there and read it to someone yes I think that's absolutely true it's so the content has to be properly proofread and critiqued but the production of the book has to be properly done as well a nice book will still be there in a hundred years' time, sitting on the shelves of the British Library or the Bodleian Library. There it will be. So you're making something for the future, and it's 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 your heart and soul, isn't it? It's got everything. It's got everything in it. It's great fun. <laughs>